Coming up today, the Dow Jones hits 40,000 for the first time. A look at inflation, meme stocks, commodities, Biden rescheduling marijuana, and a stealth bull market investors are finally waking up to. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to the Click Capital Daily Market Review. My name's Jared. Thanks very much for tuning in with me today. If you haven't already, think about hitting that subscribe button. And big shout out to all my regulars who hit that like button every day. Thank you for supporting this channel. And here we are again. Higher highs, higher lows, and the S&P 500. Before finishing a little lower, basically flat on the day. And there's the Dow Jones Industrial, surpassing 40,000 for the first time ever. And just looking at market color, still quite a strong risk on mood across the board. Volatility yields, the dollar and inflation expectations. Below those short and medium term moving averages, whilst we've got most risk on sectors uptrending across the board, except for energy, which is the sector that has the lowest correlation to the overall market, can often go in other ways. And so the stock market is on a roll here and could still have further to go even in the short term before we reach those overbought levels we typically see in short term tops. Now I've got the fear and greed index back in the greed zone at 60. Typically the market will put in short term tops above this level, 65, 75, even 80. And my own S&P oscillator sitting just below 60, the overbought zone there. And we are getting a few reversal signals firing off here with my DSI not quite in overbought territory either. And like I said a couple of weeks ago, that big crush and volatility risk premium. Option dealers just lowering their IVs pretty much in line with realized volatility was a giveaway that this market had legs. And we got that big crush ever since Jay Powell and Janet Yellen came out and backstopped the market. And it's still pretty much sitting flat here today. So the market should be well supported, even if we consolidate pause, have a little pullback here. And so whilst US equities finished down today, what really ripped up was Chinese stocks, FXI, China large cap ETF, up almost 3% today on strong volume. This market's getting back into trending mode now. And this shows why it's good to have some international diversification. And I'd say investors are finally waking up to this market now, looking at the price action this last couple of weeks. Because up until now, it's been a bit of a stealthy bull market. China stock market, now up over 20% year to date. It's about double the American stock market with some strong moves in their internet ETF KWeb on the back of a huge rip in Alibaba today, up 7% on massive volume. Again, I think it's investors finally waking up and institutional money coming back into this space. As most of you know, I'm long Alibaba and also long Tiger Brokers. Another good day, high highs, high lows. And it's not only the technicals, we've got some good fundamental developments coming out of China. After one of their largest companies, JD.com, rallied after they reported first quarter results well above expectations. And probably the biggest problem in the Chinese markets the last couple of years, their property market. They overbuilt, created so much capacity that it had an inevitable bust and they've actually been popping up as well on rising expectations that local Chinese government entities are going to do a little government interventionist policies themselves and buy up excess housing to help revive the struggling sector and we've already got some cities creating programs to participate in the housing market help put a floor underneath it something they had been staying away from and just trying to let capitalism do its thing. However, just like we see in the States with the Federal Reserve, intervening in otherwise free markets does help to prop up asset valuations. And maybe that's why we got some of the best and brightest in this business, like billionaire David Tepper, heavily switching his portfolio and increasing exposure to Chinese stocks while at the same time decreasing exposure to American stocks, now making Alibaba his biggest holding. And just looking at the price action we got here today, I'd say a lot of institutional money has taken note of that and followed him in to this trade as well. Getting some big volume breakouts here. Really strong momentum. And even though we may have a short term pullback or consolidation, this type of price action bodes well for the medium term. And with stocks like Tiger Brokers, I've still got fair value at 851. And Barber that I'm also long, I've still got fair value at 120. And that's dynamic, that changes every day as well. And so, so far so good. This year for Chinese stocks, just looking at the Click Capital portfolio, the top 10 ETF picks I gave out to you guys at the start of this year, as a whole is up 8.4%, not including dividends. With dividends, it's a little bit closer to 10%. And the position in Chinese small cap ETF, ECNS, fourth best performer so far, up 8.3% for the year. And my number one pick, Cannabis up 39% for the year with uranium and junior gold miners coming in number two and three. And so my thesis for making cannabis, my number one pick for this year was the fact that it's been beaten down a lot. There were signs of accumulation, price action looked good and supportive, but more importantly, my thesis was based on the premise that the Biden administration would look to reschedule cannabis at some point this year before the election, as he always promised. And it looks like he's making good on that promise today, making a historic 
announcement moving to reschedule marijuana with the Justice Department soon going to post its proposed rule to move cannabis from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3. Then there'll be a 60-day public comment period before the rule is potentially finalized. Biden said this is monumental. Today my administration took a major step to reclassify marijuana from a Schedule 1 to Schedule 3 drug. It's an important move towards reversing long-standing inequities. So, so far so good on this trade as well. Moving in the right direction. That's really going to help out the industry, reduce their tax burden, give them access to proper for financing and allow them to better compete with the black market as well. And just looking at the cannabis ETF MSOS, we did get a bit of a move in the regular session before reversing back, but just looking after hours now, we're up another 2%, trading around $10 a unit. We've got some better moves looking at some other pot stocks like Aurora Cannabis, up about 7% in regular session. Same with Canopy as well, up 11%. And just looking at the weekly chart of MSOS, I still think this has potentially a lot more room to run this year and maybe even going into next year and 2026 as well. It'll probably be one of my top 10 picks for the Click Capital portfolio next year as well. And just touching on inflation for a minute here, after we got that CPI print yesterday coming in line with expectations, market seemed to love that, even though it's still 3.4% annual inflation growth, just shows you how low the bar is for this market to be pleased, the type of environment we're in now. However, that doesn't mean inflation's gonna magically disappear or go below 2%. Like Wall Street's number one man, Jamie Dimon says, inflation is worse than people think and the market is too optimistic about a soft landing, in which I agree with them. Still said that rates were likely to go higher than people might think. Going on to say, I think there are a lot of inflationary forces in front of us that may keep it a little bit higher than people expect. Listing examples such as green energy transition, infrastructure build out, and geopolitical remilitarization as worrying sources of accelerating price growth. And he's got a point, you know, because just looking at super core inflation, that's less housing and energy, just at a basket of goods and services, that's still tracking just below 5% year over year, well above where we're used to being most of the time in history. And just looking at the CPI index and its cumulative growth, we can just see with the naked eye how much that has accelerated since COVID. No coincidence, there's also the acceleration. And M1 and M2 money growth, over a quarter of all US dollars out there in circulation have been created in this period here. And the biggest reason for that is the current US federal government spending like they've never spent before. Just looking at this long-term 100-year chart of the US federal deficit adjusted for inflation. Typically in wars, governments will spend a lot, go into deficit like we saw in World War One and World War II. There's a little bit of a deficit spending in the 80s, going into the early 90s, and then quite a bit in the global financial crisis, which it bounced back, but then nothing like what we've seen since COVID. Record deficits when adjusted for inflation as well. And that is the biggest cause of inflation in the economy, which hurts real people. You could think of inflation as a tax on the working class because the percentage increase of necessary goods and services to survive goes up a lot more as a percentage of their salary compared to the top 1% like Jay Powell and his mates. And if inflation gets bad enough, that can cause uprisings in society and even societal breakdown and falls of empires when looking back through history. And one could even argue the fall of the Roman Empire was from the same things. They printed a lot of money, try and prop things up, which it did for a little while, especially helped those at the top, but then it led to hyperinflation and eventual societal breakdown as the illusion can only be kept going for so long. So they say inflation's not that bad. Well, that's true. If you're into rental cars, toys, used vehicles, airfares, appliances, and furniture. However, if you need things like auto insurance, rent, housing, meals, personal care, transportation, then you're feeling the pinch in the year over year cost rises. And these are the official reported numbers, which a lot of people say is quite on the conservative side. And that's why we're already seeing companies like Cracker Barrel, a restaurant chain, slashing its dividend, closing stores, and signaling more trouble ahead as it sees fewer and fewer diners coming in. And that's because consumers are already pulling back on discretionary spending, even though the economy is apparently at full employment. So let's just hope inflation doesn't keep following the same path of the 1970s, in which we initially shut up in a first wave, like we did in 2022. We've pulled back, kind of plateaued out, going sideways here for a bit. Back in the 70s, it even went lower. Fed thought inflation was done. They started cutting rates, just like this Fed's about to as well. And that just laid the ground, which led to a second and higher wave going into the late 70s. And then even into the early 80s, mortgages were at 15%. Can imagine what would happen to the housing market if we saw anything close to that again. And sovereign buyers are taking note of all this printing in the States, in which it looks obvious they're trying to inflate the way out of their debt. So we've got China, the second largest buyer of US treasuries, dumping a record amount. And this chart is in a downtrend lower highs, lower lows, and it could be a case of little by little, then all at once. 
as this is set to accelerate as China looks to diversify their reserves more into gold than USD assets and take away the United States leverage over them and ability to issue sanctions, likely in preparance for a possible invasion of Taiwan in the coming years. And so with that, we had Treasury yields find their footing today, closing a little higher after they did dip down yesterday. Now got the two-year sitting around 480 and the 10-year sitting around 437. And it'll be interesting to see whether these bond yields can stay down like Powell and Yellen want them to, or whether the bond market acts in defiance and trades back up. Then Powell and Yellen will have to pull a few more rabbits out of their hats to get these yields lower going into November. Nonetheless, what's happening in the real economy to most people are two very different things. And we can see that by the performance in the S&P 500 so far this year. Already above all Wall Street research analyst year-end targets bar one, Yardini Research. So we're way better than what the street expected and we're not even halfway through the year yet. And now we've got other billionaire investors like Stanley Druckenmiller holding a call option on the Russell 2000 small cap index as his biggest position in his portfolio, having thrown that on in Q1 this year. At the same time, reducing his position in NVIDIA while still keeping Microsoft as his second position, 10.6% of his portfolio. And we started off this week with Meme Mania after Roaring Kitty aka Keith Gill, posted a few memes on Twitter. Market went wild, ripped up, but as expected, they're going to try and cash in on that. We heard AMC planning a share offering, going to try and issue 23.3 million shares in exchange for 164 million of bonds, implying the stock has been issued at 733. As this is pretty much the only way they can stay alive is keep selling stock to the market to replenish their balance sheets. However, we had another sharp pullback today, down 15%. Really volatile, up another 7.3% after hours as I speak. Same with GameStop, down a whopping 30% today, having a little bounce after hours. And that low from Monday is at 24.77, which could be a bit of a line in the sand. We'll see whether it can defend that gap. And who knows, maybe we have another run at it now that the market's breaking out to all-time highs. And since he hasn't even said anything, we don't even know if it's really Keith Gill behind these memes or his account's been hacked. But either way, it looks like an orchestrated pump. There's already big price action going into this week in these stocks. A lot of people loading up on out-of-the-money call options. And whoever's pulled it off has probably made a lot of money. And like I said, it may not be over yet. That certainly revved up the engines of Reddit traders, Wall Street bets, with a huge 30% of trades in GameStop on Monday made by individual investors. Normally institutions, ergos, hedge funds dominate. The small traders are getting back in. They're really excited by all these memes and what it means for the company. It'll be interesting to see whether this can keep going into next week and further. So moving on to commodities, we've got oil holding its ground here on the back of a little bit of a drop in US supplies. Geopolitical tensions seem to really cool down. We've got Russia's Vladimir Putin currently meeting with China's Xi Jinping, looking to further solidify their ties to benefit of each other. China gets cheap energy, Russia gets a much bigger partner to trade with, and there's a look at crude oil futures. Holding ground there, around $79 a barrel. Gold still drifting higher, silver sitting at highs, copper consolidating, nutty gas still walking the line, and another good move up for orange juice. Moving on to Bitcoin, we've got some big institutional players coming into these new ETFs. Morgan Stanley revealing a 270 million investment in the Grayscale Bitcoin ETF, making it the top holder, which is an interesting move considering the Grayscale Bitcoin ETF still has the highest management expense ratio. We've also got the state of Wisconsin, purchasing 163 million of Bitcoin ETFs in the first quarter as well. Getting in on the BlackRock and Grayscale ETFs. And there's a look at the price of Bitcoin, just holding above its 50 day VWAP, still consolidating. And I'm thinking if this risk on mood continues it too could have another stab at all-time highs above $74,000 a coin. And there's a look at the largest Bitcoin ETF I bit from BlackRock. And whilst we've got discretionary consumer spending pulling back, that's not the case for consumer staples like we saw again today with Walmart hitting a record high on the back of better than expected earnings. Revenue grew 5.8% year over year, $161 billion in the first quarter, posting earnings of $0.60 cents a share, well ahead of analyst estimates of 53 cents. Slightly raised its guidance for the rest of the fiscal year, and they expect second quarter sales to increase between 3.5% and 4.5%. It's music to the market's ears. Shot the stock up 7% today, and that's an all-time high. Current market cap, a little over half a trillion, and that spilled over to the entire consumer staple sector. XLP ripping up to highs as well, 1.42%. That was the best performing sector today. The only other sector in the green, aerospace and defense. Otherwise, it was a sea of red out there. Led lower by home builders, ARC, retailers and IPO stocks. Whilst we had other defensive sectors like healthcare and utilities pretty much trading flat. Worst performing factor today was momentum stocks pulling back whilst low volatility stocks actually broke out. So still a bit of a defensive move happening in this market as we break out 
to all time highs here. And just to look at the economic calendar we got today, initial jobless claims pretty much coming in line as expected. Housing starts coming in above expectations. And what isn't really talked about is import prices up a lot more than expected, 0.9% versus 0.3%. That's really inflationary. If the prices of goods coming into the States is going up a lot, that filters through into retail prices and inflation. That is, if it gets reported correctly. And just looking out to tomorrow, Friday, pretty light in the economic calendar. Just a little bit of inflation data from the Eurozone. And just to let you guys know, I won't be in the office tomorrow to make a daily market review. I've got a good friend in town, so we'll be going out and playing a round of golf, but I'll be back in the saddle next week for my regularly scheduled daily market reviews every trading day after close. Fed fund futures still pricing in about a 70% chance. Going to get a cut in September, and they're just pricing in two more cuts in December and March next year. Corporate Insight is coming back to their trading, just doing a little bit more selling than buying, not that much more than usual though. And just looking at market breadth, we are a little stretched here in the short term. 76% of stocks above their 20 day average can be areas where the market can have short term tops. Can go a little further though, towards 90. There's a look at breadth above the 50 day and above the 200 day, looking pretty healthy there. It's what you wanna see in a healthy bull market. Most stocks above their long-term average and other signs of risk on sediment like high yield bonds holding up pretty good. Clean energy, which can correlate pretty well with China. Did have some signs of accumulation. However, just going out to a long-term weekly chart, one could still argue it's in this multi-year bear market. We still need to see some signs of a stage one accumulation phase before we can go into that stage two, which Chinese securities have appeared to have entered now. There's a look at Apple drifting higher after its earnings announcement and Nvidia, high highs, higher lows, just within points of all time highs as we go into earnings next Wednesday. That's gonna be the big event for markets next week. And we very well could see a big gap up from that as companies are still spending big on AI. And we just heard a couple of weeks ago from Super Microcomputer, they beat on expectations, closely related stock that's popped back up as well. And one of the most beaten down semis, AMD, it's managed to reclaim its 50 day today as well. And there's a look at the largest stock in the market, Microsoft, not too far away from all time highs either. While well, Tesla continues to consolidate and trade a bit softier. And then consumer discretionary stocks like Nike, still on a bit of a downturn, while staples like Costco, actually trading up to new highs, just like Walmart. There's a look at one of my favorites, AMARC Precious Metals. Been looking a little loosey goosey lately, up and down in volatility. There's quite a few shorts in it from hedge funds. They did just have a big miss on earnings. There might be some games being played around here with hedge funds. So we'll be keeping an eye on this and potentially putting a stop in around 32 if we fill this gap just to protect ourselves and maybe come back to it as I'm really not sure to what to make of all this up and down volatility after this earnings. It's looking a little weird here. And other staples like Coke and Pepsi ripping up there as well. Offensive traders are alive. And like I said, the discretionary stuff like Best Buy still trading a bit soft and a little bit soft there for the financials today as we go into the weekend. All right, guys, there we have it. We broke out to new highs again today. May consolidate and pause here for a little bit. I'm not sure if we come back down and we retest 52.40 or not. Volatility is really low. Market seems to have gone parabolic ever since Jay Powell and Janet Yellen came out. Bond yields are still pulled back and market breadth is there, even though We've got some leadership coming out of defensive sectors like staples and utilities. Technically, the market's still on strong footing, and we don't really have much out on the economic calendar next week. Just that big earnings report from NVIDIA. That'll be an interesting one. But like I said, what is alive and well is Chinese securities. Look at that rip. Price action. Momentum thrust on volume. That's really good stuff right there, along with the really strong rips and Alibaba as well. That's all I've got for you guys this week. Thanks very much for tuning in, and apologies I can't make it in tomorrow. But like I said, I'll be back next week in full swing of things and of course i'll be watching markets in the meantime thanks very much and enjoy your weekend i'll see you next week cheers